Today, I'm gonna to give my race recap of the 2021 California International Marathon. Twenty six point two miles, three hours, two minutes and twenty eight seconds as my official chip time, which gives me a seven and a half minute buffer under my BQ cutoff time. Very happy with the result. It wasn't quite the sub three that I was hoping for today, but I'm ultimately very happy with how everything went today. It was a race I ran a little bit conservatively, I would have to say, but I do feel like I left it all out there on the streets of Sacramento. And ultimately, I really couldn't have asked for much better on the day. Now, I do want to get into a very deep dive on all the numbers, and we'll get into where I feel like I lost that two and a half minutes from getting uh, under three hours for the day. But I do also want to go over kind of like my kit, my nutrition, and like just reviewing the race uh, overall in case you are interested in running the California International Marathon. So that's where I'll start with some of like the logistics and how the race was. So um, if you're watching this curious about CIM, you probably already know that it's a point to point course. Uh, that is a net 340 feet of downhill. It's a race that builds itself as a BQ factory. Uh, the statistic that I heard fre frequently over the weekend was that like one third of the participants at this race uh, are getting their BQs at this race. So it's a place where people come to race fast. And I will say after having experienced this race, this is a great place to do it. I, I feel like this is like a runner's marathon, a marathoner's marathon. Everything's run really well. And it's certainly like organized and operated from the perspective of someone who's run very many marathons before. And I definitely appreciate it. So uh, first thing, we'll start from like gear check um, all the way kind of like through the end of the race in terms of like the race organization and execution. So this year they did something different where uh, they did gear check either the day before or in the morning at the finish finish line. Um, they didn't have anything at the start line. This is my first year running it, so I've not experienced it that way. The only way I've experienced it was the way they did it this year. Um, it opened at four o'clock in the morning. The race starts at seven, but it opened at four o'clock in the morning. I got there pretty much like right away. I was able to drop off my bag super easy and then pretty much head from right there over to the bus. Now you have to take a bus to get from either, there's a couple of different locations where the buses are, but I think the main one is downtown by the finish line area, that's where I was. So I hopped on a bus right away. I was expecting like uh, a yellow school bus that was gonna be pretty uncomfortable for uh, what I understood was supposed to be a 45 minute ride. It ended up being a pretty nice bus, very comfortable, had some uh, great seats and I was able to relax on the ride up there. So it was a very good ride for me. When we got there, we had plenty of time between when we arrived and when the race was actually gonna start. Some people got out and went to the bathrooms right away uh, so they could use the restrooms and then like come back and hang out on the bus because you were allowed to hang on the buses um, to stay warm and just to stay out of the weather. I got out there, used the bathrooms. Um, there, I've never seen so many porta potties. Like they were literally from where you started, um, they had lined this one street that they closed off and it was literally porta potties as far as the eye could see. It was really quite amazing. So I went down quite a bit to use the restroom and then I went back and sat on the bus until about maybe like 6, 5, 6, 10, 6, 15. So like 45 minutes before the race started. At that point, I got out, kind of checked out like the corral area, make sure that there wasn't some like corral closing time like I've seen at uh, like Chicago, for example. Uh, Chicago, you usually have to get into the corrals and they close. Um, about 15 minutes before the gun goes off. So there wasn't anything like that. So I went out and ran like the line of the porta potties uh, down as far as like they had closed off the road and, and then back um, as my warm up. And I had plenty of space to kind of just jog around. I did then at that point get rushed because I think I kind of like messed up my timing just a little bit. I maybe went too far out for my warm up uh, and I could have been a little bit more careful about that. 
because uh, then uh, I was like, oh, maybe I have to go to the bathroom again. So I stood in another line. At this point, kind of everyone from the race was there. And there was a little bit of a line, even though there were so many porta potties. Um, so I stood in the line for a while and then it started to get to be like about 645. And so I was like, you know what? I don't really have to go. I'm, you know, I went. You know, so I was fine, but you know, the nerves, you always think that you'd feel better if you could go one more time. But I left the line and I started heading over to the crowds. Once I did, uh, it started to get very crowded. And this is pretty much the only one critique I have for the entire race is I wanted to run with the three hour pace group, um, but the way they had like lined up the flags, there wasn't enough distance between like the three hour pace group and like the three hour and five minute pace group. Um, so everyone was really packed in. I've never been so packed into a crowd ever at any race. So it was a real surprise uh, that that happened. You know, people were kind of like, you know, moving around, trying to get forward, trying to get closer to the pace flags. I was like, it's probably going to be fine. I don't, I'm not worried about it. Everyone's getting real tense and I'm not going to worry. Um, but, uh, you know, and it ultimately, I guess it was pretty okay, but I do wish that I'd gotten there maybe like five, 10 minutes earlier. So I could have gotten closer to the, um, to the three hour pace group. Then pretty much right at seven, we were off. And uh, at that point, you know, then the corral emptied really fast. Lots of fast runners there. Everyone shot out really fast. It was very humid that day, but also cold. And so there was a lot of condensation out. You know, there's certain parts of the road that are a little bit more like kind of buffed out because um, of like the way that the traffic flows over roads. And I was always worried that my foot was gonna slip just a little bit on some of those spots because at least visually they were shiny and looked a little bit slick. I had no problems with my traction, but it was always kind of something that I was like had in, in the back of my mind. That didn't last the entire time, but it was definitely in that first very downhill mile where it was a concern. So um, other than that, as far as the course goes, you know, there was a very wide streets pretty much the entire time. The aid stations were laid out maybe like every other, about every other mile or so, sometimes a little bit more frequent than that. The first couple of aid stations, when everyone's still bunched together, they had aid on both sides of the street. And then once we got further into the race, it was only on the right side of the street. There was like bananas or goose if food was available at the aid station first, then it was noon endurance and then water. And it was always that order. And the volunteers that were uh, manning those aid stations uh, always did a great job of letting you know exactly what you're getting, even though the cups were differently marked. Like the noon was in blue cups and then the water was in white cups. So uh, always worked out really well. They did a really great job of making sure they, they could to the best pot possible, keeping those areas like swept clean very regularly. So like it was, I mean, it looked like an aid station at a marathon, but um, you know, it was in really good condition. So I was really impressed with how well everything was managed on a point to point course, which is a little bit harder to kind of do that to a high level, but they certainly did that here. Um, and I would say like, as far as the course goes, it was, you know, um, hilly. And we'll talk about that a little bit more detail when I get into like the raw numbers. Um, but like, you know, it wasn't an uphill course. None of the hills really killed you. There's like one or two um, that were a little bit more extended uh, that you really noticed. Um, but, um, you know, for every uphill, there's a downhill. And overall, I found the course to be really enjoyable and a lot of fun to, to run. It's not super scenic because you're running through what kind of feels like suburbs or maybe even like closer to exurbs. But, um, you know, the roads are nice and wide, plenty of room. Uh, the uh, camber on the road isn't really too great at any point uh, until you get closer to Sacramento. At that point, the roads narrow just a little bit, like on some like, you know, multi-lane one way streets like in a city. And the camber then gets to be a little bit more like um, noticeable. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, uh, there weren't any real major areas that you had to like avoid running in. This is really a course for getting into a pack, staying with the pack, focusing on what the pack is doing and just running. So it's not like, you know, super scenic and lovely. There was one point right around the halfway point, we had gone through some turns, there's a relay as well. Um, but after the relay point at the halfway, or about the halfway point, there was like a very, very long stretch of just straight. It was a little bit rolling, but it was just very, very straight. Uh, and that was really nice for me to be able to kind of like lock in, try to like zone out, lock in. I mean, like there's two different things, but like, I think you know what I mean. Uh, and get into a rhythm really well. That was a, a stretch of the course where um, I really appreciated that it, there wasn't a lot of turns. There wasn't a lot of distractions. It was just running. So like the course is, is, is really well designed to be able to uh, perform well. The race is organized and executed flawlessly. 
at the finish, um, all the markings are very clear. Uh, they don't rush you out of the finish shoot either, which I thought was pretty cool, at least for when I finished. Um, I got to kind of like stick around and watch some other people that were running with me throughout the day kind of finish as well, or they were waiting and I got to see them uh, when I finally cro crossed the finish line. So that was just a really great finish line experience. Uh, and there was a lot of spectators there as well. So the energy is really high. Uh, and then afterwards we got like a water bottle, like a noon water bottle, which looks pretty cool that says CIM finisher on it. They were giving out these bags that had some snacks in it, but I was feeling pretty nauseous. So I didn't take any of that food. Um, I've never thrown up after a marathon before. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I felt like I was pretty close to it this time. Uh, and then, uh, so I passed that, but then I got my medal and then they had these like jackets that you could wear, not like the foil, but like jackets with like a zipper and stuff. So I actually thought that that was really nice. And I think is a lot easier to, I don't know if it works better than the foil, but, um, it's easier to manage and kind of like use and wear. There was uh, a BQ bell and the line for the BQ bell was super long. It was so long that I didn't even try to get in there. Instead, I headed directly to the beer tent where I was able to get some beer courtesy of Sierra Nevada. So overall, from a race standpoint, this is a fun race to go and visit. A lot of people travel for this race um, and a lot of people who are trying to run fast times come to this race. And there's people a variety of paces too. I'm not saying only fast people come to this, um, but like people all different levels come to this as well. Doesn't matter your pace. If you wanna have a good race or if you just wanna have a good time, I think you can easily do both of those at this race. Highly, highly recommend it. All right, now let's get into some more specific. Let's talk about um, the kit and nutrition. First of all, let's talk about like a race kit. So I wore the Rabbit PR Collection singlet. I thought that worked out really well. I wasn't sure like the night before if I was gonna do that. Or I have the, also have the Rabbit PR Collection short sleeve. Both of those, the material is really nice. It's soft and lightweight, very breathable, but not sheer. I don't know if you guys remember, some of like the earlier, and I think they still make some of the pieces like this, the earlier Rabbit shirts used to be almost silky. And for me, they're comfortable and they were super lightweight, but when I got them sweaty, it really felt like they kind of like clung to you a little bit. Um, the new rabbit stuff is not like that. I don't know if it's a different material entirely or if it's the like the material plus the, the venting in terms of the mesh, but it worked out really well for me. I remembered it the first couple times I wore it being a little bit baggier, but for some reason when I put it on this time, it felt like it fit perfectly. Uh, maybe it's because it wasn't a windy day. So uh, I just felt like it the fit was great. And I think that at 40 to, it was like 45 degrees at the start and humid. Um, that was uh, perfect for running. Um, in terms of temperature and comfort. Um, I didn't even notice that. I, I mean, I felt like I wasn't wearing anything. You know, it just felt really great to have on. Um, and uh, it was a really great piece. Performed extremely, extremely well. I was also wearing the Rabbit, I think they're the Pocket Half Tights. And I've been looking for them online. I don't know if they're sold out or if they're not selling anymore now that it's cold, but um, there's like the Pocket Tights and those are long, and then there's a pocket tights fleece or the pocket fleece, which I also have a pair of those. Um, it's the same design, just one's either a half tight or a full tight. They even make it like a capri length as well. Uh, I had the half tight, and that I think is like the perfect marathon uh, pants because they've got two pockets, uh, one on each side, and then a zipper back pocket. And what I did was um, I just distributed, I had six gels total, and I distributed them two on each side and then two in the back. Uh, and they, that was like a really nice way of distributing the weight uh, of the gels. And so at no point did I feel like I had like a pocket full of stuff. Um, everything just like kind of worked really well. Nothing got lost. I was able to get stuff out of the pockets without like worrying that other stuff was gonna fall out. So like no worries about those at all. And I felt like they were just perfect for me. Uh, again, another piece that I highly recommend. For the hat, I went with the Path Projects hat. I think it's a John Muir or the Muir cap. Uh, that one worked really well for me. Uh, I did have gloves as well. I went with the very, very thin Kalenji gloves from Decathlon, really cheap, I think under 10 bucks. So I felt like, you know, if I end up like trying to shed them during the race, uh, then, you know, not a huge deal. And I did end up uh, getting rid of them at around mile 20 or so. Well, maybe it was even later than that, uh, that I was finally felt like I was warm enough that I didn't really need them. 
Um, so yeah, all the gear, I think I feel like I made good choices as far as clothing and everything functioned really well for the shoes. I went with the new balance RC elite two, and I'd been for a long time thinking that I was going to run with the adios pro two, cause I really love the pop on that shoe. It feels like uh, a very special shoe. It kind of has like a race day specialness to it. Plus the way that that shoe set up, like if you're running like with good form, like if you're focusing on, on mechanics, I feel like the shoe really rewards you with like a little bit of extra pop, a little bit of extra kind of like momentum. Um, and I wanted to have that, especially like for later in the race, but later, late in my training block, I went for, I think it was an 18 mile run in them and my foot really started hurting my right foot. And so I was like, I would rather go with something that's a little bit safer that I can hopefully avoid some foot pain. So I picked the RC Elite, Elite 2. Also a really great shoe, very lightweight, but has a little bit more squish to it. A little bit less pop, but a little bit more squish. So I went with comfort versus like, you know, raw performance. Um, but I think it ended up not mattering because my foot gave me uh, trouble either way. Uh, at no point did it, I think it really hurt me or, or like, you know, slow me down, but it was a distraction and pretty early on. So I'd say like mile maybe eight, maybe nine. Um, it was a really big distraction, maybe even earlier than that until maybe like around mile like 16 or later. Once I started getting really tired, maybe I was distracted by other things that were then bothering me. Um, but then the foot pain eventually went away. But I will say that like today, uh, running like walking around now the day after the race, my foot, like the pads of my feet feel very raw, like that there was either rubbing or friction or just, it just feels kind of like generally hot underneath there. So I think that, you know, my, maybe I just got some foot pain late into a training cycle that didn't quite get to hundred um, percent. I, I'm not going to blame the shoes for that one. I think it wouldn't ma matter what shoe I picked. I think I probably would have had a little bit of something there. Um, but you know, that was the only kind of drawback from it. Otherwise I do feel like, you know, it helped me like in that long stretch that I was talking about where I was just trying to like zone out and lock in, uh, you know, running with good breathing, good form, good mechanics. I felt like the shoe was working with me really, really well. And, um, we put in some really good miles together. So I highly recommend that shoe as well. I like it. Um, and uh, if you're looking for something that's a little bit more squishy, a little bit more forgiving rather than a little bit firmer like the Adios Pro 2 is, then I do think that it is a really good option. All right, now let's talk about nutrition. Uh, we'll go over that quickly. Uh, I went with a six gel strategy, uh, five Martins and one Huma Chia Plus. I did three non like three regular Martins and then two caffeinated. And then the Huma gel that I had is also caffeinated. And so um, the main idea with the Huma was to get a little bit of extra salt in me. And I had that as my second gel. Um, and then I also took Noon Endurance, which has uh, not only electro uh, sugars, but it has electrolytes and salt in it as well. So I think I stopped at like every other aid station, although towards the end, I think it was every one. And then uh, and I think that worked out well for the temperature and the heat. So it wasn't that hot. Um, I mean, I was soaked through on all my clothes, but I don't ever feel like I was sweating or I was hot. So um, had I been more sweaty, I think that I would have paid a little bit more attention to getting more salt in and just getting in more fluids, even if I wasn't thirsty. Um, but uh, for this one, I felt like the amount of fluids that I took in was great. Um, and uh, I had no problems with the gels. Although for gel three, I think it was, uh, maybe it was gel four. I think it was gel three. It was not a caffeinated one. There, that was the first time ever that I've taken a gel and then my stomach started gurgling. Um, and I didn't know if it was maybe my stomach was empty. I got on the bus like at 4.15, 4.30 in the morning for a 7 a.m. race start. I did have a couple, like two granola bars. I think I had one like Cliff Bar and then one uh, Kind Bar. So I had two bars uh, over the course of like between 4.30 and 7. So not probably as much as I normally have kind of on board from my running, uh, at least for my long runs. Um, so maybe that's what it was, but I was worried that I was going to have GI problems at that point. Uh, but it ended up being fine. Uh, I was able to take down the rest of my gels without really even worrying about it. Um, I did feel a little bit nauseous, uh, for quite a while after, after the race. Um, but you know, ultimately everything was able to stay down and I felt like the nutrition was just right. The only thing that I might've changed, I might change, you know, uh, think, or in retrospect, Monday morning quarterbacking it 
is that uh, I don't really think I did as good a job of, you know, carving up in the two days kind of before the race. So, uh, you know, I'd come just from Austin uh, at the, the running event for directly from Austin to uh, Sacramento. And so like there, like I had eaten a lot of food, but very like different than kind of like my normal routine. And then going to the weekend, still away from my normal routine because I'm away from home. And so like, you know, I'm not really sure how many carbs I got in, but I'm pretty sure that I didn't have quite enough. Would that have made a huge difference? I'm not really sure, but that's one thing that I'd probably look at differently just to make sure, not necessarily so much. I think Saturday was pretty good, but Friday I definitely know that I didn't eat enough and I didn't get enough carbs on that day. Um, sleep also was pretty, you know, terrible, um, just from the travel and, uh, the duration of sleep that I got, I was putting out a lot of videos from all like the things that I'd seen at the running event and just stuff that was happening in Sacramento. So I was doing quite a bit of, of work at the time too. So, um, you know, I didn't feel tired at all. So I felt like I was getting plenty of sleep. I always kind of woke up before my alarms, but I just think that's kind of like the energy you have from, uh, a good taper. So like, uh, I think if I could have gotten a little bit more sleep, that might've helped as well, as well as eating a little bit better. All right, now let's get uh, into the deep dive uh, for the numbers. And I'm going to head to my computer for that. I was able to record my data using a Polar Grit X Pro. And here's what it looks like when you're looking at it. So the main thing that jumps out to me first is that everyone talks about how it's a 340 foot net downhill race, uh, but there's rollers. So that means there's some uphill as well. And then some downhill to get you to net zero and then further downhill to that. So based on the altimeter uh, in the Polar Grid X Pro, I had 459 feet of ascent. Um, and then it calculated 837 feet of descent, which actually was a little bit more than 340 feet of net downhill. Um, but that gives you an idea of just how much downhill there is and just how much uphill there is too. Uh, at no point was it really like super intense, but you know, there's some noticeable hills there. Uh, when this data gets pushed over to Strava for whatever, I think Strava goes by the GPS tracing. It doesn't take like the elevation gain numbers at face value. It calculates it itself, I think. Um, Strava came up with like 600 something feet of elevation gain. So if you use that math and 340 feet of net downhill, that gives you like almost a thousand feet um, of downhill or running for over the course of the 26.2 in addition to the, the ascent that you also have. Um, the other thing that jumps out at me is that I, according to my stride foot pod, I've used a stride foot pod. And when you compare that with a polar watch, your pace and distance information is going to be coming from the stride foot pod. So the foot pod, which is a GPS independent way of measuring pace and distance has me at 26.53 miles. So that's uh, quite a bit more than 26.2. I do feel like that's a pretty accurate reading as far as how many steps I actually like ran over the course of the day. When you're cutting over to get to the aid station, you're running a little bit more. Um, if I'm running in the center of the road versus the tangent, um, then that might make me have some extra distance that I'm going to be running as well. So I feel like that's accurate, but I did run about, you know, a third of a mile or at least more than a quarter of a mile more uh, than the 26.2 distance. The other thing that jumps out at me is it calculated my average pace at six minutes and 52 seconds um, per mile, which is three hour marathon pace uh, at an average power of 269 watts. The interesting thing is if we cut over, so my uh, watch time was 302.24 and my chip time was 302.28. Where that comes from is there was one point where I was doing my manual lapping and I think I accidentally hit the pause button versus lap. And so I think that in the terms of like getting it restarted again and then hitting the lap button, whatever, that's where I lost those four seconds. But so think about 302.28. If we go over to stride and they have a, um, a race calculator, stride predicted that I should run a marathon at 269 watts which is exactly what I did on average for the course of my 26.53 miles. And, or it says 268 watts is what I should have run. And it estimated that I would finish that in a time of 302.44, give or take about four minutes. It actually ended up being really close. But here's the other thing. Um, in Polar Flow, you can adjust uh, your um, tracing. So if I reduce this from the 26.53, down to 26.22, 
it actually gives me a time of three hours and 13 seconds. So if we go strictly by kind of stride time or watch time and distance versus like, you know, actual chip time, I'm really close. I'm right there. Um, yes, there might be an accuracy in terms of my actual, uh, my devices that are, are measuring it versus like something that's measured more officially, but it gives you an idea of like, you know, if I could have run it, I guess, I, I, th I think it just says I'm close. So where did I lose the time that I was hoping to hit? Where did I lose basically two and a half minutes? So I think that one way to look at it is my splits. I came in with like a 131 for the half and then 302 for the second half. So it was pretty much like uh, an even split. I was hoping for a negative split. I ran the first half pretty much right where I wanted to be. I wanted to come in right at 130 or even a little bit later just to make sure that I wasn't pushing a little bit too hard that to make sure I wasn't getting too excited on the downhills and especially not on the uphills. So my strategy with the uphills was basically to treat all the uphills like recovery, chop up the stride a little bit, keep it shorter so that way I have a little bit faster turnover, but also like make sure I wasn't redlining. And that was really the only time that I was looking at my watch was to make sure that the power numbers on those uphills weren't so crazy. And so I was running in like the 260s for the most part, sometimes in the 270s when I was flat or downhill. Um, and then on the uphills, I try not to let it get over 290. So um, that's something that I feel like I did a really good job on. And I feel like I kind of survived the rolling part, the mostly downhill part of the, the first half really well. Could I have picked up a couple of extra seconds and maybe should I have come in closer to 129 than 131? Maybe in hindsight, maybe that's what I would do. But ultimately I feel like I did a pretty good job of like managing my excitement and managing also kind of my energy burn for the first half. So I felt really good about it. But looking back at it, you know, every mile there was like a couple of seconds here and there where I, I mean, some were under pace. Realistically, I needed to be like a couple seconds faster uh, on each of those miles if I wanted to hit an exactly even split. Um, but I think really in the second half, I did make up a lot of that, especially in that kind of area where I talked about that I was getting a little bit too excited. Um, looking at my watch and some of those portions, um, you know, it was a lot of downhill. I was running in the 640s for a lot of the time, uh, at least according to the pace uh, on my watch. And so uh, it felt good there, but it definitely felt fast. Sometimes we were dipping into like the mid 630s. So I was like, this is a little bit too fast. I gotta slow down a little bit. Um, and take it easy. And I'm glad I did there too, because ultimately the real place where I lost kind of all the time I had earned back and where I really like kind of like lost it was basically like in the last four miles, but really in the last two. So if we come down here and take a look, it kind of gives me my last half mile of being at 655. So pretty close to pace, but mile like 26, I think that's really, we're looking at like mile like 25 and a half to 20 uh like 24 and a half to 25 and a half to mile like 23 and a half so like 23 ish or 24 ish to 26 ish of those two and a half miles or so that's where i i gave up a, you know over a minute um and right there so if you think i had like a minute and a half or a minute and change uh at the first half that i kind of gave up a little bit too much time and then add that minute um, that pretty much gives you the two and a half minutes that I, I, I didn't hit the mark at today. Um, but in the two miles, kind of like before that, I had a 657, I had a 656. So I'm just giving up way too much time there. Right at maybe about 20 and a half miles or so, there's like a bridge and you cross over the river. And then from there, it's pretty much just downhill. There's like a little blip up, but it's for the most part, it's just downhill and then flat. It's really, really flat. If you look up here at the elevation uh, profile, it's really nice and flat. So that's an area where, you know, if I didn't feel like my legs were about to give out on me, I really feel like that's where people should be able to push. Um, so like, yes, maybe I could have come in at the half a little bit earlier, but I think then had I done that, then I think I would have had even less to kind of give. So it's like, I'm not really sure. We can kind of argue about scraping seconds here and there, a little off of here, a little extra there. But you know, ultimately for me, I'm just not quite at the level of fitness uh, to be able to run the entire race at that goal pace. Uh, basically, you know, I had four not great miles at the end, two that were really bad, two that were like, you know, salvageable, that strategy of kind of like, you know, dropping down a gear, 
or like taking it, uh, easing up a little bit to kind of collect myself for one last push. I think it was a good idea. I did have a little bit of push at the end, but it was kind of like the last quarter mile, maybe a little bit uh, more than that, uh, that I was able to push. Mentally, I think I kind of like defeated myself as well because I probably could have pushed for, you know, maybe another minute or so harder. It still wouldn't have got me under three hours for the day, but, you know, other lessons learned in terms of like, you know, how my body's responding to those extreme, like, you know, strain situations or stress situations. So lots of lessons learned, but ultimately I'm feeling pretty good. You know, I'm getting closer uh, to getting that number. Uh, but ultimately, you know, I'm really happy with the race I had today. Uh, I'm not devastated that I didn't quite get there. Ultimately, it's a PR for my 40s uh, and the fastest, uh, it's the second fastest run uh, I've ever done in terms of the marathon distance. And the only time that I have faster, that's a 301.53. It's from the Tunnel Marathon, which is a super fun race to run, but it's also about 2,000 feet of downhill. So it's a very different kind of race. Um, so I would say like, you know, maybe I'd put like a mental asterisk on it, uh, on that one. So I feel like really, uh, I'd, I'd feel very comfortable calling myself a 302 guy and I'm very happy with that. Maybe I could run faster without the selfie stick. A lot of you guys have mentioned that, but you know, I'm just not that interested in that. You know, if we get under three, fine. If we don't also fine, you know, I'm really happy with my running. I'm having such a good time doing what I'm doing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I really wouldn't change a thing. So, uh, that's my race recap of the CIM. Uh, I always want to say CIM marathon, but that's like, you know, redundant. That's my race recap of California international marathon 2021. If you have any other questions, feel free to put them down below or better yet stop by the live stream. I do Monday through Friday, right here on YouTube. I'd love to talk to you guys in the chat. That's all I have for today, everybody. Thanks so much for making it all the way to the end of this very, very long video. Hopefully you guys are staying safe out there on your runs and I'll see you in the next one. Yo, what's going on?